Clear prop. Star 73 is Cherokee, number two, following twin traffic, three mile final. There's nothing to do. One Charlie Bravo, makes it in runway 25, going uh, four mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now, let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I am fantastic. This week we have an, a returning guest, one that uh, we really enjoyed the last time. Welcome back to the show, Paul Craig. Thank you so much, uh, Bobby and Wally. So great to be back. It is great to be back. And as you come back, you have a new book. Uh, we still give away and sell copies of The Killing Zone around here on a regular basis. And I'm excited to share that uh, you launched Flight Times on February 1st. And I've got my copy on my desk. And we're soon to have many signed copies around here to uh, reward to our students and those that, that go to school here. So I'm excited. Well, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for that support. So... The first thing I noticed, and and I told Wally when our books arrived that you kindly shipped to us, that uh, it's got 52 chapters, and it looks like we could do a show on all 52 chapters. Let's hope not. Let's hope not. Well, I mean, I, I think every listener, the, the, the titles of the chapters are very interesting and appeal to us, us aviators, whether it be a chapter called Ice or whether it be something that we probably have done before in the air. Um I think we all know three strikes, you're out. And I think each of the titles are very interesting to readers. Well, I hope everybody enjoys it. It was written in a, in a, a very storytelling way that hopefully will be, will be appeal, but we'll learn something by doing it. Yeah. So big, broad scope from the killing zone to flight times. Tell us a little bit about where flight times came from or how you worked on it and what, what some of the goals were with flight times. Thank you. I, yeah. I've been writing it off and on for goodness for years, I think. And, um, uh, it's just experiences that I've had and uh, people I know have had and that, that I think all pilots can, can benefit from. Uh, but really, the, 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 it was mostly finished with, without a title until a, only a couple of few months ago. Uh, but whether you know it or not, Bobby, you had a big influence on uh, how this turned out. Because when we got together last uh, time I was on the show, um, you made the comment that the that the that the book, The Killing Zone, you know, that's a kind of an ominous title. And uh, if you're just getting started in aviation, you know, it's maybe not the book you'd give as a Christmas gift. But what you said was it's kind of hard for us to put it out on the counter because it's, you know, it is such an ominous title. Um, and I can talk more about why that is maybe today. But but uh, I had this, I had your voice, Bobby, ringing in my ears as I was coming up with how to do this. So, so flight times is for a much broader audience. And it's, there are some discussions of some accidents in there, but basically it's how we don't have accidents and, and how, um, you know, these are happy endings. And, and hopefully um, along the way, we, we learn from, from best practices and lessons learned along the way. So that's really the, the, the idea was to try to broaden its, um, its uh, appeal. Yeah, and I remember your voice rings in my ears that we we don't know about all those accidents that didn't happen because a, a really good instructor talked a little bit more about trim to to the young man that was that was maybe going to have an accident if he didn't hear about that trim story or whatever those the all those many many incidences that were so close to being something really bad but that last hole in the Swiss cheese didn't quite get through and that means that something big didn't go wrong. So I, I think about that all the time. I, I have a, a heightened stress level around here when weather's changing or students are soloing. And I just, I always am worried about being that next big one away from, from a bent aircraft. Right. And I, I might've missed a lot of those in the last six months because we do a good job of teaching. So I think about those comments you made last time as well, all the time. As well. And you know, the killing zone has sort of a target audience of people who are new private pilots and inexperienced pilots in, in general. And that's really how Wally picked up on it, right? Because Wally's kind of yeah. the gatekeeper and, and he's the one that has to make these assessments about people who um, are, are um, inexperienced yet, yet learning. And, and so, you know, that's sort of the, the audience. And that, I think that's really what, how, how Bobby saw it from the first. Well, I, I think that's what, what you mean, Bobby. Yes. 
And Wally, you, you've done a lot of gatekeeping since uh, the last time we recorded, which we realized was just about a year ago. Um, I bet your check rides are very similar this year as they were last year, and we, we keep doing this over and over again. But it's one of those things we just can't necessarily get all – all the things right. It's it's a it's a crazy world that we live in in aviation. It, it is, and and what what you and I have, have we've had this discussion where we've we've talked about how we can say something and and think that we have said it, but what we have to realize is our audience is different. So we've got to keep saying the same thing. You know, uh, you know, a a, a band. They go around, they play the same songs every night, and they may get a little tired of it, but um, that's what the audience wants to hear. And that's what, yeah, exactly. And and that's why we have to keep, um, you know, sending out the same message. And uh, we have to realize that. We have to realize that the people are different. And, you know, uh, as you're raising your children, you know, if you have more than one kid, I mean, you... You, you teach them all the same lessons, but at different times. So as a parent, um, it's, it's kind of kind of like being a parent. You do have to say the same thing over and over again. But, uh, you know, the, the way I, I, I stumbled onto the book many, many years ago and, and was fascinated by it. And um, most of my check rides, when, when I get done with a check ride, I, we, I usually have a uh, you know, 10, 15 minute, even longer discussion with the applicant or the, the new pilot. And, you know, I'll say, well, well, what now? What are you going to do with this instrument rating? What are you going to do with this private pilot certificate? And especially with private pilots, because usually I, I would say most of my private pilots have 90, 80, 90 hours, somewhere in that range. And I tell them, I say, boy, you're you're ripe for the picking. And I tell them about the book, and uh, um, you know, not to, you know, they're they're all pumped up at this point, and I want them to walk out feeling good, good about things. But you know, it's just like I I tell my kids, it's raining outside and it's it's slippery on the road. Be careful. Well, you know, one of the hazardous attitudes is invulnerability, right? The invulnerability is the attitude that you know something bad. It can't happen to me. Or, you know, I know about accidents, but that's really for those careless pilots. It's never going to take place with me. But that's really kind of one of the targets of the killing zone because, um, you know, that book is filled with accident um, commentary. And there's not a single one of those pilots that went to the airport on the day of the accident thinking they were going to have an accident. Yeah. Right. If they thought they were going to have an accident, they wouldn't have gone. So all these people didn't think it would happen to them, but it did happen to them. So by having sort of an ominous title, hopefully it kind of grabs them by the shoulder and say, you know, we, we love flying. It's the greatest thing, but we have to be meticulous and we have to be careful. That's why that's why it stays fun. Well, and anybody that's ever listened to this show knows that we talk about fuel a lot and there's still people running out of fuel or having fuel exhaustion problems. And you none as Wally says, none of those people woke up that morning saying, I'm going to go fly a plane and run out of gas and None of them did, and so it's very similar to that. And and we just we just had an uh, an incident. Nothing happened, thank goodness. But a, a pilot and a CFI were doing some IFR training on a day in Houston that I literally wore shorts and a Columbia shirt to work because it was sixty five degrees in the morning when I left my house, and around five o'clock it was thirty four degrees. But during that day, the temperature was dropping, and you know the freezing levels are coming down, and it was a marginal VFR day. And they picked up a little bit of ice and we've had so many conversations and debriefs about it, but he said, I can hear the CFI right now in my head saying, he said over and over, I never intended to get into ice. And, you know, isn't that pretty much how all these air, air safety incident, you know, stories go, the, the videos from the AOPA and you're like, golly, that sounds so much like a story that didn't end well. And we're lucky this one ended really well, but man, it, it's not intent driven. It's just the culmination of all the things coming together. You know, it's, and it's how you experience these things where you learn and become better. And, you know, Wally, you just said something uh, just a second ago, but you also said it on one of your recent uh, podcasts on personal minimums. You you said that uh, after an instrument pilot passes his check ride, um, sometimes you'll ask them, 
you know, what, what now? What are you going to do with it? And some of them have told you that they had no intention of flying in the clouds. They just got their instrument rating just to, you know, work on their skills. Do you recall what you said about that? Yeah, I, 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 I would hope I would tell them that they need to go fly in the clouds. That's exactly what I recall. And, you know, when I heard that, it, it reminded me of something that Wilbur Wright said. Now, he didn't say it to me directly, okay, because, you know, he's been dead 110 years. But, but he said this quote, so we're getting, we're getting it from second, third-hand information. He says, if, you, if, you, if you're content with perfect safety, then you would do well to sit on the fence and just watch the birds. But if you really want to learn, you must mount a machine and learn through its actual trials, right? Now, today we wouldn't say mount a machine. We'd say strap in and close the hatch, right? Right, right. You, you have to get out there and just as Wally said, you've got to go fly in the clouds. You've got to, you've got to build your personal minimums. No one is suggesting you go out in, in conditions that are over your head. So find out where your head needs to be. That's what personal minimums are. And then go right. practice. And, um, yeah. and, you know, also on that same show, the personal minimum show, uh, Bobby, you, you came up with a gem of a, of a recommendation. You said that when you log your flight times, you also record the wind that was present during that flight. You, you remember that? Oh yeah. I, I always put down the crosswind component, how much it was, how big the guess factor was so that I knew I'd at least experienced it. If I had to experience it for the first time again, now, see, that is a terrific recommend. Everybody should start doing that tomorrow. Okay. I've got thousands of entries in my logbook, but not a single one of them mentions the wind. So what you, what you've done is you've cataloged your personal minimums and right. you know, I'm a researcher. I can show you how to take those numbers and show a trend line. So, you know, how your personal minimums were getting lower or higher. So you weren't just, you know, making up a number, you were using a scientific approach to, to come up with the personal minimum for yourself. And it was just, it was just a, a great recommendation. Hope everybody starts doing it. I was going to say, we do that with airplanes. We do it with the maintenance logs. We, 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 we can go back the life of the airplane. We'd say, gee, how many vacuum pumps have we put in this airplane? What, you know, we, we do that. So why not, you know, as you said, why not do that with a flight? Yeah, I, I, I think if you, especially an instrument uh, flight, you know, there's, there's the basics and then there's the things you learn by getting out in the system. Right. right. And um, I, I remember uh, I was flying into Washington National Airport in Washington, D.C. one time and the weather was low and it was raining and um, the, the, the tone on the radio was professional, but it was a little tense. And um, there was a single engine Piper pilot that had diverted. Uh, he was, supposed, I guess, going somewhere else and couldn't get in because of the low clouds and was diverted to Washington National. And, uh, and um, I remember that the controller he asked the single engine Piper pilot, he says, uh, what speed can you give me on final? Oh, now let's pause the story for a second and review that. This, this controller, Washington National, he was not a rookie, right? The, the, they, they don't, controllers don't start off at Washington DC. So this was, a, this was a veteran experienced controller and veteran experienced controllers, they already know how fast a single engine Piper can go, right? So if he already knew the answer to the question, why was he asking the question? Well, the, yeah. the reason was he was actually sending a different message that, that if you don't fly in the system and become a little savvy with the system over time, that you would miss. The, the message that that controller was actually conveying was, look, pal, you're the slowest thing in the sky today. We're trying to get everybody on the ground so, you know, I'm doing you a big favor by letting you come here. So you're going to, have to do me a favor by giving me pretty much full power to the threshold. That right. was the message, right? right? And everybody on the radio understood the message, except the private, the Piper pilot. He came back with, well, I used to do about 65 knots. And everybody on the radio was going, oh, good grief. This guy's not playing the game. So we're all going to have to hold. And. And what's worse, this guy didn't even know there was a game being played around him, right? Because right. because he he was probably great with his fundamentals, but had not used his personal minimums to work his way into the system and learn how everything comes together. 
Well, we said so much. I have three or four thoughts, and I can't keep track of all of them myself. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna rewind a little bit to the conversation we were having about the the logbook entries and the wins, and and either tell on myself or, or show something under the covers. You know, I, I was such a scared young pilot that. I was afraid to ever go fly by myself if I knew I hadn't done it before, right? So it began with if the winds were 170, 10 gusting 15, I wrote that down to make sure that I could also put a smiley face or something next to it to tell me whether I thought I could handle that. Because if I thought I could handle it alone, I might go try it. But I probably always did something a little bit less than that. And I look back and think about that today and go, well, I know my I know my hard ceiling's 10 knots across wind. I won't go in 10 knots or worse. So for me, it's 9.9. And you're probably going to have a hard time getting me out the door at 9 because I know it could be 11 really easily. So I have some hard lines. But those are ever-changing. And I just – both of y'all are a little bit – just a little bit more senior than me. Is there any other thing in the world that is so unique as aviation to where – as you grow through it, you kind of don't do what you used to do anymore ever again. And as I say that, I'm thinking Wally's training to fly a bigger jet and he never goes back and flies those littler jets, right? There's no like retention bonus to keep Wally in a smaller aircraft. I don't think there is anyway, right? There's no good, there's no good in that for aviation. So we're always trying to strive up higher. And I look back thinking I was worried about winds right down the runway if the winds are right down the runway now, I don't even think about it as I go fly, especially if it's not gusting. So it just seems like aviation is so unique where people continue to grow and build. CFIs are here for such a short period of time, and many of them will never fly GA again, right? What's I don't know if you know the percentage, but the percentage can't be very high for once I get into the airlines that I go back to GA. I don't think it's very often at all. I think uh, I try to encourage those airline pilots to keep their flight instructor certificate uh, renewed because they, because who knows when they might, <laughs> you know, not need to use. It. I have a friend who's an airline captain and he let his CFI expire, but then his daughter wanted to learn to fly. And so I helped him get his flight instructor certificate back, but he, you know, he, he should have never let it expire in the first place, but you're right. They're, they're usually not, they're usually not coming back. I don't know what the percentage is. Right. But even to then, it's like it's like everything else. We, we we leave one type of aircraft to go to another, and we very rarely go back. We we learn instruments, and but we're still private. I guess we still fly VFR, but we're not. We don't do the same maneuvers on a regular basis. It's like it's, it's a constant progression. It's a constant growth. The growth never stops, right? And we hope it doesn't stop because we should always be learning something. Of course. Yeah, I, I think of it like in in my career, I've thought of it in five year increments. I think you know. Five years ago, I thought I was pretty good. But, you know, I've learned a lot in the last five years, so I'm better than I was. And 10 years ago, I thought I was pretty good. But, man, I've really learned a lot in the last 10 years. And 15 years ago, I thought I really had this all taken care of. But, man, have I learned a lot since the last 15 years. So, you know, you just never – it's a lifelong learning thing. Yeah, I just – I guess chefs chefs and other occupations, you do continue to grow in them. But I still just – I just think chefs still chop onions and I just think there's something we grow out. We keep growing out of things and it's a constant churn to get to the next level. It just seems very unique to me. Oh, I agree. So Wally, you are in training and uh, I know you're not a rookie, but you're a rookie on your new aircraft, I guess. So um, what, what kind of things are you reflecting on as, as you kind of sit in a new seat and uh, take on your new set of flight times in a, in a bigger, bigger jet? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good for me to be in the seat that I'm in. And I, I don't mean in the left seat of this jet. I'm talking about me to be the, the person who's under the gun right now. I mean, I have my first gate that I have to uh, go through on on uh, Friday, two days from now. It's um, called the systems validation, which is basically the oral. Um, and uh, and I'm stressed. I'm stressed right now. I'm I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, what happens in this scenario? Is it is it uh, is it the right hydraulic system or is it the left hydraulic system? And uh, so. Uh, you know, it, it's it's good. Um, it's good to put a little stress on me. I one thing I always worried about my my daughters is what how are they going to act under stress in an airplane, and 
you don't really know until it happens. Uh, they used to go fly all the time, and I'd they'd come home, and I would always say, "Have have you scared yourself yet?" And and it was a long time. They would both look at me. They'd say, "No, no," and I I was I. I I, I was scared because they had not scared themselves in an airplane yet. But when then they both came back and told me a story of, oh, dad, this happened today and I wasn't sure what to do, but I did this and um, it turned out, you know, obviously it turned out fine. I didn't hurt myself. I didn't hurt the airplane and I didn't embarrass myself. You know, we, we all think of that too. Um, and, and I said, okay, all right. I was able to breathe a little bit either easier because I said, okay, now you have scared yourself in an airplane. I think all of us have scared ourselves in an airplane. Hopefully we get to walk away from it. And, um, you know, so it, absolutely, absolutely. You learn from it. And, you know, I, every flight, I mean, at, at, at our airline, I mean, we debrief every flight and we say, okay, what could we have done better? And it's or, or what or what went really well? What did we as a crew do that went really well today? Well, hey, the way we handled that last minute runway change with ATC, we briefed it previous because we anticipated that it might happen. And and, you know, we talk about that. And, uh, you know, then we talk about what didn't go so well. All right. Well, the way, uh, you know, uh, well, whatever, we missed this taxiway or or whatever. So we 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 talk about those things. And Every flight, every flight we use as a teaching moment. I, mean, I remember my very first check ride, my private pilot check ride, and I passed. And when I was done, the examiner said to me, congratulations, you now have your license to learn. Right. And I didn't understand. I thought I, 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 thought I had to learn to pass. It right. didn't hit me yet that I, the learning had just started. Yeah. And that's, well, that's always what we got to think. You know, my typical applicant, my typical private pilot applicant has two solo cross countries. They have done two cross country trips where they were pilot in command of the airplane. Now, come on, really? At that point, do they really, you know, and, and these cross countries are. Were uh, they maybe, to the same exact place? <laughs> well, a lot of times they are. A lot of times they are. One's 2.6 and one's 2.5. But once they pass that check ride that you pass them, they can go into a class B airspace. Land in yeah. Atlanta or Dallas or Denver. Absolutely. An 800 mile cross country trip. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I, of course, have a very clear perspective on what it's like. There was a, a student here today who did his first cross country solo and uh, he's been gung ho. He's, it seems like he's got his head on his shoulders right. Seems like he's working really hard. But I, I'm sitting here thinking, like, young man, you have 33 hours of flight time. Maybe, maybe. And you just rented one of my planes and flew over 150 miles. And, you know, he's in there telling stories just like that new pilot we all were. Oh, I, I missed the squat code and I had to re-enter the squat code. And, you know, the winds were a little cross over here. And it's all the excitement. You, I love to hear this every day around this flight school. But these young men and women have no idea how little they really know still when they're doing that first and second cross country. It blows my mind that we let people do this. One of the cool things about this podcast and that Wally participates in this is that here's Wally with better than more than 25,000 flight hours. Right. But mm. he's got, he teaches the right attitude. He teaches the right procedures that, that a 250 hour or a 25 hour pilot. If, if, in other words, if, if it's important to Wally, it ought to be important to everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and I talk about that a lot in, in, um, you know, it's, it's, a lot of times we're flying around in 172s, and we may be in a, a P model 172 that's fuel injected, so it doesn't even have carburetor heat. Let's be honest, there's not a whole lot on the landing checklist of a Cessna 172, especially if you're staying in the pattern and that landing light is on. Uh, you know, other than flaps, there's not a whole lot more, but we still have to do checklists because. Next year, you're going to be in a Bonanza that's got cow flaps. It's got a landing gear. It's got a, uh, you know, a fuel selector that you can switch. So it's, it, it, it's, it's building habits. Amen to that. And, and I, think, I do think about these young pilots. 
do they do they even know what's out there in front of them, right? I thought, I got to be honest, the first time I flew a G1000-172, I thought I was in the most sophisticated thing I would ever fly. And, of course, I've had the opportunity to fly some jets now and ride in the front and, and have some of the control. And it's extremely immense of all the switches and all the buttons and all the whistles that you have to be thinking about. And uh, I don't know. I don't. Again, the progression happens, but I don't think you know in your private days just how far you're going to go in these aircraft and how complex they're going to be. Well, that, that's yeah. exactly true. But I still fully support the 33 hour pilot and encourage them and and oh, sure. um, and help them, you know, understand that this is a progression and we've only just started. It is it is a license to learn. No, no doubt about that. No doubt about that for sure. So, Paul, the book's full of stories. Uh, I know you're a storyteller. Uh, we still have plenty of time on the show here. But what what's some of the best stories in the book that uh, – Maybe future readers should hear you talk about to get them enticed to go get the copy of the book themselves. Well, first, let me say that the subtitle of the book is is instruction and inspiration from the second best flight instructor. So let me just go ahead on the record. I'm not the second best flight instructor. That that subtitle is actually a tribute to my uh, mentor and former flight instructor, the late great Bill Kirshner. Uh, for, for for many of us, a generation of pilots uh, learn from. Bill's books and airplane manuals, and and I was so pleasured, to, you know, fortunate to 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 know him and to fly with him and be his student. And um, he he, uh, he he's literally uh, instructed a million pilots <laughs> with his through wow. his through his books. Yeah. And uh, and so he was working on one of his books in the late nineties. And I I was not a co-author by any means, but he would. He would call me sometimes on Sunday afternoon and we would talk about something that he was going to put in the book here or there. And, and so when it came out, he sent me a copy and on the cover or inside cover, he autographed it for me. And he wrote, he says to Paul Craig, the second best flight instructor in the world. So now Bill was hilarious. He had the best sense of humor. So as long as Bill was around, nobody was going to be number one. Everybody had to be second or less. Gotcha. So that's, that's really I'm not boasting. Um, I'm just I'm just paying a little uh, tribute to to my mentor. I, I I know dozens of flight instructors that are far more talented than me. One of my past flight instructor students is now himself in the flight instructor Hall of Fame, Fred wow. Nauer. So so um, yeah, I'm I'm just one flight instructor along the way um, to try to try to pass along. But but you asked the question. There is there is a chapter on Bill Kirshner and my experience with with him. Uh, and, and how, how important that was to me and how valuable that those lessons are for all of us, uh, to, um, to learn from, uh, there's, you actually mentioned one of the chapters is three strikes and you're out. That's sort of my version of the, of the Swiss cheese model, right? Uh, James reasons, Swiss cheese model of, of how the, the layers of safety protection, sometimes the, the holes all line up. And, and I, I, I recounted a story of that happened to me and, and I think it was, it's different than, than an accident report summary because, you know, when you read an accident report and try to learn from its facts, um, you know, we weren't there when the accident happened. Uh, I, we weren't there firsthand. Uh, when the National Transportation Safety Board comes up with their conclusions, they, they never say this is definitely what happened. They, they say this is probably what happened, right? They have a probable cause. And so it's always some kind of second hand for us. So I wanted to, I wanted to put some stories in the book that were firsthand, um, and and how um, you you have to think through things sometimes to, in order to keep yourself safe. And so that was a story about I was you know I worked for a university and fly for a university, and we we often go uh, recruiting for uh, athletes. And so this was a flight to, uh, for for recruiting. Uh, football players and on the I had one of my flight instructors in the right seat and uh, so we experienced a hydraulic failure on the way home and there was low low clouds and you know how did we think through you know that that low pressure light coming on that was strike one and you know strike three in this analogy would be an accident so you can never allow strike three to happen well one of the best ways to never allow strike three to happen is to never let strike two happen and so um 
that that was uh, you know my way to try to portray how exactly uh, you could utilize this the 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 safety measures and the and the Swiss cheese model in real in in, in real time. So I, I hope it's hope that's informative and have people think it through on their own. Um, so yeah, that's that was one of the one of the personal accounts. Well, and there's so many in this uh, from from chapters that are titled Lost Art, which I can begin to guess what that's a little bit about, to spin video, to hypoxia, and it's got to be uh, both educational and informative to the reader to get to, to read those real-world stories maybe before the big accident happened, uh, as in the killing zone where we're, we're, we're learning from a bunch of unfortunate incidences and accidents that didn't turn out quite as well as I have, so, I have a feeling some of the stories in the book did. Well, that's what we're hoping to do. I mean, we're all, all three of us and a whole cadre of folks like us. Our, our job, our mission, our calling is to try to train out the next accident so that it never happens. Right. That you know, something we said or an example we set uh, would, would come to a pilot in a moment of stress. Like while I was just saying, you know, have you scared yourself yet? When that happened, did you keep your head? Did you keep your cool? Did you think of the best options? And did it turn out to be a favorable outcome, a safe outcome? That's what we're after. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to ever, wouldn't it be great if you, if you couldn't write a book full of accident reports because there were none. Right. Yeah. That would be a great world. <laughs> yeah. and, and we're never going to probably achieve that, but man, we're going to work hard. So, so Paul, you're also participating uh, and have participated in the past year uh, with my flight school. You've, you've uh, done an event, uh, some four or five weeks ago on vertical airspace, something you've done in the past, uh, which was a wings event. We had almost a hundred people sign up for that. Uh, some from around the world. And if you're listening to this show and you want to participate in another one, Paul's going to be doing one more event for us on April the 2nd. If you're listening to this prior to April the 2nd, 2022, uh, check out our website, unitedflight.com forward slash courses and I bet you're going to be able to register for that course. He's going to deliver it via Zoom. Uh, no matter how many people want to attend, we're going to make it available to them. And everyone that attends will be entered into a drawing to win multi one of multiple copies of Paul's new book, Flight Times, and uh, some copies of his previous book called The Killing Zone. Uh, we're going to make those available. And, uh, Paul, you're going to get some big boxes in the next few days Uh for, with full of books to sign for us, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm really excited about April 2nd. Uh, when Bobby and I really haven't talked about this much, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to make a presentation on a project we did where we took pilots and put them in stressful situations. It was in a, it was in a flight simulator, but um, uh, we then uh, went through the process of uh, analyzing, you know, how stress works on a pilot, how we can overcome those things. And it's, it's a fairly, uh, well, anyway, it'll, It'll be entertaining. We'll learn a lot, and I'm really looking forward to April 2nd, so please join us. Yeah, and y'all talking about being, being scared, I, I tell people every day there's a full motion simulator less than 15 feet from me right now that I think goes underutilized every day because we can simulate uh, the not inadvertent flight into IMC with a click of a button for every student that goes to the school and see how they handle it. And I think it would be very eye opening to most to just see how, how disoriented, how quick it happens, um, how truly unsafe it really is. And never mind adding ice and vacuum failures and all the other things that we could do in real time to teach people just how stressful it could be under those circumstances. So I look forward to that event for sure. And, uh, I look forward to uh, everyone learning more about your work as an author as well. Wally, anything you want to talk about or wrap up with before we go today? No, I I, I just want to echo your your sentiments about the full the simulator. Um, you know, I I talk to instrument newly instrument students all the time, and or or pilots, I should say, all the time, and we talk about minimums, and they, you know, everybody uses two hundred two hundred and a half as the the benchmark and I says well what if what if you're in a situation and you have to get down and it's 100 and a half what are you going to do have you done that and that's that's what a simulator is for 
put in a hundred and a half and fly that ILS or that RNAV, whatever. Yeah, is it below minimums? Yeah, is it you know something you you ought to make a practice of doing? No, but if you're you're in a situation where you've only got another eight minutes worth of fuel and you need to put the thing on the ground, that's that's a great opportunity to uh, to practice that in a simulator. And, and it's a I was perfect say, way to uh, increase or work on your personal minimums because yeah. you can do that in a simulator without without danger, but you're still working on your skills to make your personal minimums, uh, you know, more more lower in some cases, and we're higher in case of wind and things like that. I, I so really quick I, when I was in college, just a long time ago, I did make a flight to visit one of my buddies at uh, Auburn University. And I went there for the weekend and I was supposed to fly home on Sunday. And on Sunday, the weather started getting bad, but I really did need to get home because it was in the summer and I had this job at the warehouse and uh, that job was going to help me pay for college the next semester so I could keep in, so I could stay in school. And I, and I, I didn't think I could call and tell my boss at the warehouse that I had been down in Auburn for the weekend, you know, and never less fly to Auburn because he'd surely would fire me. So I couldn't lose this job, but at the same time, my personal minimums were preventing me from flying home. And so I called my parents and my mom answered the phone. I said, mom, look, I'm down here in Auburn and I can't come back because the weather's just too low. You need to call my boss and tell him that I'm sick and that I can't come to work. And my mom says, well, you know, I know the job is important, but I really don't know that I can call and just lie to the man. I said, mom, put dad on the phone. So <laughs> my dad gets on the phone. I tell him the same story. He says, I can't lose this job. You got to call him and tell him I'm sick, you know, and, and my dad's an ordained minister. So I'm asking the minister to lie now. And um, so I hang up the next day. The weather's better. I fly home. No problem. I, I was safe because I exercise my personal minimums. I get on the ground. I call my dad and I said, so did you call the boss? He said, yeah, sure it is. Says, so am I fired or what? And he, he said, no, no. He said, um, he said, he'd see you tomorrow. I said, what exactly did you tell him? Because I need to get my story straight. And my dad says to him, I told the man that you were under the weather, <laughs> <laughs> which technically was not a lie. Oh, that's good. I love that. I one. kept the job, but I used my personal <laughs> minimums. Maybe next time I should have come home sooner, but, oh. but the one, the one last thing I might say is we should always listen to Wilbur and Wally. There you oh go. Boy. All right. There you <laughs> go. Well, Paul, we're definitely going to have you back sometime. I can't wait to keep reading more of Flight Times. Uh, we have a little special project that we're not announcing yet, but we'll uh, have some news to share with others in the future on something we're working on together. Well, the and, book's uh, on Amazon, so check it out if you like. Yep, it'll be in the show notes as well. We'll put links to both of the books in the show notes. And uh, if you want to check out Paul's event with us on April 2nd, if you're listening to this before that, don't hesitate to go sign up for that. Paul, thanks for joining the show again today. As always, everyone. Thanks so much for both you guys. You're doing terrific work. Everyone, stay safe and stay behind the prop. Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe. <laughs>